Sponsors, Toby, they make the world go round. Well, our world anyway. And we've got a few here at the top of the show that, uh, you know, like to join in on the giving fun at patreon.com slash the final app. We sure do. It's really cool. Before we get into the sponsors, though. What? I saw our dear buddy, Davey Siegel. We were seated next to each other okay. in the media center this weekend at Martinsville. Bought him some hot dogs. We got to partake. All right. So that was good. I had a total of six throughout the weekend. I had four with Davey. We we split two bags of four. So that was good. Wow. How about anybody else? Anybody else approach you? Um, no, nobody else approached me at all throughout oh, the whole weekend. That's I so didn't sad. have I it was fine. Like so I ran into some fans and stuff, but nobody, I guess, heard that I was gonna be buying hot dogs from anybody if they asked. So I got out of the out of the Luck, trip pretty pretty lucky cheap. you, yeah. <laughs> that's very cool. Yeah, so it worked out uh, pretty well. I was pretty happy with that. So all right. How yeah. are they? Are they are they flavorful? Are they not worth it? Are they worth oh, the cost? No. So for two bucks, I mean, you can't really go wrong with two bucks for a concession item. Yeah, uh, but true. they're really good. I mean, depends on what you like. If you if you like slaw and all that stuff, then add it on and it's great. If you just like chili, just a chili version of it is really good. So yeah. um it's a pretty good two dollar item. The hot dog itself uh, in there is delicious. So it's good. Like when I go to Dodger Stadium, that's the draw. That's why you go. That's, you know, because the dogs are so good. And for a while there, they were inching up in price and they were approaching like the $10 mark for one hot dog. Oh, and that's then crazy. all of a sudden they dropped down to $6.99, which I think is okay. That's not bad, especially in that market there, the LA area. I mean, things yeah. are a little more costly there. So I think $6 hot dog is not bad. Of course, my 14 year old likes three of them or whatever. So throughout the yeah. game. Man. <laughs> so. I still can't believe your children are that old now. Yeah, no, I can't either. So, man, how about those sponsors? Now. Yeah, let's get to that. <laughs> We're just going to babble all day long. So let's get to our sponsors here. How about uh, let's start with our uh, our ultimate final lappers there, Mr. Louisville Max. Thank you, Louisville Max. Uh, and, of course, Alex Taylor as well there at the ultimate final lappers here. Thank you guys so, so much. We've also got Devin. We've got um, who else? We have David Letchworth, Joe Bike. Uh, over there at the Only at Mattress Giant level tier. So thank you, guys. And Joe Bike, uh, by the way, is the longest tenured sponsor of uh, this year's show. Really, really cool to see. So thank you all. Back to you, Carrie. All right. Half hour later, let's uh, let's kick off the show. Patreon.com slash the final app, by the way. All right. Here's the music. Whoo, man. Are we done? Okay. Checkered flag is flying on this show. This has been... It feels like it, right? And we have like nothing to talk about. I mean, no, no big race coming up or anything. Before we talk about anything, we it, was this truly the first pace car DNF? Dude, that was <laughs> wild. So did you see what actually happened there to cause that? I loved all, yeah, the marbles and stuff. But I loved how all the cars are kind of holding back, holding that we were not supposed to pass the pace car. We're not, <laughs> all right, fine, we'll go. They were all being so good, so orderly. Uh, yeah. And yeah, that was pretty wild. So there was a big chuckle going on in the media center. Uh, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. Uh, the fans in attendance couldn't believe what they were seeing. Uh, wild stuff. You don't plan on the pace car not making it to the, the conclusion of an event. Right. Uh, but it shows you how tough Martinsville is if the pace car can't even make it. So marbles or something knocked off one of the, the ECU or something like that, right? Yeah, you can see like the wiring harness was just hanging out the back of the car. So. Right. And I will say, by hanging out in turn one towards the end of the race, you could see massive chunks of rubber flying off these tires. I mean, a huge there was a huge ball up at the top of the groove at one point. Right. Uh, so if one of those hits a street car, I could definitely see it doing some pretty good damage because those things were pretty massive. Now, the NASCAR, to their credit, I mean, they didn't miss a beat. Pace truck was up there really quick to get to take over the, the field. Um, so that was pretty cool. That was, and then they had a backup pace car ready to roll right after that. So, I mean, really, really smooth transition. It didn't waste a lot of laps figuring out what was going on. They did a really good job, uh, like you said, moving the action. Uh, and at the end of the day, we saw the best uh, Martinsville race in the next-gen uh, era. So those that may be wondering why in the world would they have a backup pace car, they actually use it to split the field at the beginning of the race to come down pit road to give them a chance to check their tech and stuff like that. So that's why they have two pace cars. But I think this is the first time it's actually been used as a backup. Yeah, if, if it's been used like this before, it maybe was when the guy stole the pace car at Talladega that one time. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I've never personally seen it in my years of covering the sport. So it was really interesting, a different dynamic. And going through the garage at the end of the race to go down for quotes and you just see a, a pace car out there with the hood up and them trying to figure out what's going on. It's pretty funny. <laughs> totally. Totally. All right, let's get into it. Victory lane. We had uh, some guy named Ryan Blaney 
Uh, wow, what a race for him. Absolutely amazing. Heads to Victory Lane, and uh, it's his first career at Martinsville, which he considers his home track. He said it uh, throughout the uh, post-race stuff. He led 145 laps on the day, second win, by the way, in the last five races. So Blaney, I'd say, has got the the, the magic mo right now, the momentum. Yeah, you add in that it's his third win of the year, which ties his career best. Um, and it comes a year after having zero wins, but still making his way to the round of eight and then having bad luck kind of do him there. So he's learned from his mistakes. He talked about that uh, in the post race. His, his crew chief, uh, Jonathan Hassler, also talked about Ryan taking a look in the mirror at the end of the last year, uh, saw that he was competing for the win with Joey Logano at Phoenix last year. And I, he, Jonathan Hassler said that that day, let Ryan Blaney mentally know that if he can make it to Phoenix as a championship contender, he can win the title. Um, and he went in the off season, really worked on his game, wanted to make sure that there were no errors down the stretch that prevented he and his team from, you know, getting the max out of their, out of their performance throughout the year. And on a year where Ford has been talked about as being behind the eight ball and, uh, you know, Joey Logano got knocked out in the opening round of the playoffs on a Ford and, you got Ryan Blaney that's having a career year now and now will battle for a championship for the first time ever in his career. Right. And with the round of eight, they just had, Holy crap. They're, they're, yeah. they're firing on all cylinders right now. Yeah, for sure. So uh, advancing to the championship race this coming weekend at Phoenix championship weekend, all three series in action, by the way, Kyle Larson, Christopher Bell, Ryan Blaney, those three with wins, and then William Byron just hanging on throughout the race. In fact, part of the race, most of the race, I even texted you, he was not in and yeah. barely scratches in. Yeah, well, and he had some other issues throughout the day, too. His helmet fan wasn't working. It was a very hot day in Martinsville. He was really yeah. having to manhandle the car. He wasn't happy with how things were ill handling. They never really got it right. He um, collapsed uh, after the race, I noticed. He was on the side of his car uh, sitting. May yep. or may not have puked. I don't know. <laughs> he did not puke. I was there. Okay. I saw it. Uh, he did <laughs> immediately go out, take take a seat, uh, and look very out of it. Uh, conducted his post race uh, interviews uh, from the pit road wall, sitting on it. Um, very hot day, uh, and when your Hamlet fan's not working, that's definitely not good. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, he did exactly what he needed to do. He grinded it out. Uh, he and Rudy Fugel will go to a championship four appearance in Phoenix. They earned it. They've had a really good season, and that really good season is what puts them in a position to have a bad day uh, at Martinsville and still work their way to the next round. Yeah. I mean, honestly, we talked about this last week. A, a championship four without William Byron with the season he has had would be just a, a travesty. A shame. It would, but it's a travesty and a shame we've seen several times in this format. So it wouldn't have been yeah. unexpected. Uh, but, you know, when you have, and we talked about this on the show too, Ryan Blaney wins. And all of a sudden now the the things have shifted a little bit. And you had uh, both guys, Ryan Blaney, Denny Hamlin, putting up lots of stage points uh, throughout yeah. the day. Um, and it really put the pressure on William Byron in that 2014. But they they did pull it off. Oh, but it was so sad. It was not to be for poor Denny Hamlin. Does not make it. Knocked out. Ha ha. <laughs> Man, you look so happy about it. I will say... Uh, he competed pretty well throughout this race. He definitely looked like a guy who could possibly win this thing. Obviously, Ryan Blaney had just a whole other level of things on the long run, which is interesting. Yeah. Because usually it's Denny Hamlin that's the best on the long run at most of these tracks. But Ryan Blaney had it figured out uh, in this race on Sunday. But Denny Hamlin put in a really, really strong effort, finished third, uh, won stage one, finished second in stage two, racked up a lot of points, just wasn't quite enough. But yeah. I feel like... We criticize him a lot for how he portrays himself in the media yeah. uh, and after the race kind of, you know, egging on the fans and stuff like that. I feel like his response in his post-race interviews was super classy. I feel like he really, he really hit it home uh, with the way he did it in the, in, after the defeat there. I sadly agree. Wow. Okay. So that, <laughs> that tells you, that tells you that he was really classy in defeat. If, if you're agreeing with that, because you are usually on the opposite end of the spectrum when it comes to Denny Hamlin talk. I was actually surprised at how well he, uh, he took it. So, and I will say he got out of that car, uh, and you can see the tears in his eyes. He knew this was a year where if he made it to the championship four, he probably had a pretty good shot at winning this thing. This was his uh, year. He kept saying yeah, it. This is, my, it, this is our year. It was. And, you know, had it not been for the mechanical failure at uh, Homestead, which sent him in the wall, this very well could have been. Uh, you take those points he lost right there with that, and he's in comfortably. 
Yeah. So that is the difference maker there. You look at the other guys that were eliminated in this thing, and they're no slouches either. You had Tyler Reddick, who won several races this year, looked really good at points in the season, just yep. struggled all weekend long, spun in qualifying, never really had it, finished 26th in this race. That's a major bummer for those guys. That's not the way you want to go out uh, in a championship bid, but yeah, that, that is how it goes. Regular season champion Martin Church Jr. also eliminated. Uh, he had an abysmal playoffs. I mean, just such a good regular season. One top 10 through nine races so far in the playoffs. Yeah, and so incredibly, as he should have been, uh, critical of his pit crew. And then it's ironic that he speeds on pit road, which is under his control, and that kind of doomed his chances. Well, honestly, I think at the end of the day, that's actually a better situation for everybody involved, that it wasn't just the pit crew. It wasn't just the crew chief. It was the yeah. driver, too. They all made errors in this yeah. nine-race stretch. And at the end of the day, that's why they're sitting at home. Well, they'll be in Phoenix, but they're not in the championship <laughs> battle. So yeah. uh, that is, that, that's a bummer for them because I know they felt really good going into this playoff run. But at the end of the day, they just didn't execute. And if you don't execute, especially in this round of eight, you're not going to move on. And even if you do execute in the round of eight, there's a chance you're not moving on. So and, uh, that's that's just how it goes. And then uh, Chris Busher, who had three wins, I think, in five weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, he was he was on fire. There was a point in literally actually with a pit stop at one yeah. point. It looked like Chris Busher and that 17 team were unstoppable. Now, the playoff push for them ends with an eighth place finish here at Martinsville in the round of eight. But they they sent a message this year that RFK team is for real because Brad Keselowski had speed this year as well. He made the playoffs yeah. and had his car not caught fire. Who knows? He was looking pretty good in this race as well. Um, but just there's something there with RFK. I feel good about them going forward. I think this was the year they needed mentally in that shop to kind of understand that they are true contenders. They can get this done. And I think they take a step forward next year because that was a really impressive effort. So over the course of the history of the final lap, the radio show and the podcast, the top two interviews, the top two drivers that are neck and neck, and it's like plus 20 chats with these two guys, are Ryan Blaney and Justin Allgaier. What about that Xfinity Series race? Oh, my gosh. That was the one to talk about. That is <laughs> something we're all still talking about it. That was and then the fallout afterwards. too. Yeah. Oh, my God. Totally, uh, totally. This is just, you can't script these kind of things. I mean, <laughs> no. this is just one of those things where the cup race was the best we've seen at Martinsville in the next-gen era, yes. Yep. But it didn't hold a candle to this Xfinity Series race. This thing was nuts. I mean, they were crashing all race long. I think we had, <laughs> what, 15 cautions or something? And then at the end, too. Distance. Yeah. And then you've got this battle at the end between two teammates, the RCR teammates. One's exiting the team at year's end and Sheldon Creed. The other one, Austin Hill, is the guy they've kind of pitched their wagon to. They want him full-time for years and years to come. And here they are, battling out neck and neck for the for the chance to go to a championship floor berth, which Austin Hill didn't need to win this race, by the way. He was still good if he finished second. Um, but there was just that thing, man. They get in there, their competitive fire starts going, and they start leaning on each other a lot when this restart happens. And as they're coming to white the white flag there, Justin Allgaier slams into the wall. Yeah, hard. really hard. Yeah, really hard. And I saw that and I was like, well, he's done. So he's, <laughs> yeah. In my mind, he's gone. It's the, it's those two RCR guys who've been leaning on each other and John Hunter Nemechek to me. That's how it felt. Yep. And then they lean on each other more and they go down the backstretch. Austin Hill takes a swipe at uh, Sheldon Creed to the inside there going into turns three and four. They wash up the track. Creed gets in front of him and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> And they both, like, you know, Austin Hill goes crashing behind him. The hood buckles up. It's just bad. Creed loses just enough momentum where Justin Allgaier, who looked like he should have been out of it half a lap earlier, yeah, is all of a sudden battling and, and drag racing to the line for the win. He was coming nothing. off turn three, still in third place. Coming off turn four, he was finally in second place and then <laughs> took the lead. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. It's On just, a tiny track. You cannot. I mean, it was just wild. You couldn't even try to replicate that if you wanted to do it. It was just incredible. And Justin Allgaier wins the race. He's had so much bad luck over the years in situations yeah. where it was like a, a plate track or things like that. That is all flipped this year. He had the lucky win at Daytona because it just, uh, he worked his butt off for it. But any win at Daytona in those situations where it's a tight, close race like that, it's a luck. The luck of a push, luck of things going your way. 
And then this was ultimate luck. I mean, my goodness, he should not have won this race, but he did. He advances to the championship four, and now he goes to a track where he knows his performance is really good. Yeah. And he's a dangerous guy. Look out for Justin Allgaier. He wants a championship before his career is over, and I think this is the year for him. I know we talked about this being Denny's year. This is Justin Allgaier's year. If he doesn't get it done this year, you got to imagine the the chances are running out, and this is definitely his best shot yet. Yeah. Let's get into fantasy racing from Rowdy Dragon, getting you all set up for championship weekend at Phoenix this coming weekend. And then next week, he'll uh, wrap things up for the season. But uh, let's get his thoughts. Let's get his picks for the final, I guess, uh, fantasy NASCAR weekend of the season. Well, it's not, I guess. It's true. Here's Rowdy Dragon uh, with your fantasy NASCAR. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Rowdy Dragon back with this week's Final App Weekly Fantasy Update. Well, we're fresh off the short track in Martinsville, done with the beating and banging over there. And we're heading into Phoenix, the final race of the season. Before we head over to Phoenix, let's take a look at the stage winners, see who we got over there, as well as our winner for the week. Your first stage goes to Bushmaster 14. Stage 2, we've got a tie. My buddy Sparks are flying, and the man with two names, Connor Allen. And this week's winner, we have a tie between Moonshiner 3 and, again, the man with two names, Connor Allen. Coming up with 254 points, 70 stage points on the day, not so bad, guys. Maximum points for the day was 277. All right, taking a look at Rowdy, Toby, Carey, and our sponsors to see how we did last weekend. Rowdy, I finished in the 26th spot, pulled me back up into the top 10 in the 8th position. Toby Christie finished in the 19th spot, top dog out of all of us this weekend. Currently sits in 112th in the league. Carey Murphy, Jimmy is back. Had a 49th place finish on the week, sitting in 117th, roughly 50 points below Toby. Can Carrie catch him? We'll find out this weekend. All right, taking a look at our sponsors, Joe Bike. He finished in P31, currently 19th in the league. Louisville Max finished P39, sitting in 28th overall. Devin, DL Racing King 11. He finished 26th, tied with myself, and currently owns the 122nd spot. And finally, David, Wolfie Dragonfly, finished in the 64th place and is sitting 30th in the league. Okay, taking a look at our final featured picks for the season. Going into Phoenix, we're going to take a look at the top dogs in number five, Kyle Larson. He's got 18 races run at the track with an average finish of 11.7. He's got seven top five finishes, finishing up there in 39% of his runs, 11 top 10 finishes, finishing in the top 10 in 61% of his runs. Laps led has him at 382, and Kyle has one win at the track. Looking at his stage point picture has him collecting stage points in 19 out of 24 tries, three of those being stage wins. Now Larson is motivated to get that second cup this weekend, and he will be tough to beat. In the last nine races in Phoenix, he's finished in the top 10 in all but one where he had a motor expire. Over this period, his average finish is 8.6. Looking back at his last run in the desert, Larson had the best driver rating, he was fastest early, and 7th fastest late, he had the most fastest laps run, and he was 3rd fastest on restarts, ultimately finishing P4. Looking at his speed rankings, places him in 3rd with an average speed rank of 3.5, he has a fast car, and if you have any Kyles left, I highly recommend placing him in your lineup for this finale. All right, our second driver, the 12 car Ryan Blaney. He's got 15 races run at the track with an average finish of 11.9. He's got six top five finishes, finishing up in the top five in 40% of his runs, 10 top 10 finishes, finishing up there in 67% of his races. He has a handful of laps led at 429 and is still looking for that first win in Phoenix. Could happen this weekend. Ryan has collected stage points in 18 out of 24 tries, four of those being stage wins. Blaney is poised to win the championship. He was the driver to beat last season, but he held back so his teammate could finish the job and take home his trophy. Ryan is hoping for the roles to reverse in this one. He is a super performer at Phoenix, also finishing one time outside the top 10 in the last nine attempts. His average finish during this period is 7.9. Looking back at his loop data stats from the spring race this season has Blaney ranked 7th in average running position, 6th in driver rating, he was 8th fastest early, 4th fastest late showing some long run speed. On the combined short flats this season, Ryan is ranked 4th with an average speed rank of 8.0 
and his speed rank from the spring race has him listed in P6, with an average speed rank of 6.0. It is highly advisable to roster Blaney this weekend, keeping in mind now that the playoff drivers will not be collecting any stage points. So that brings us to the final driver in the four car, Kevin Harvick. He's got 41 races run at the track with an average finish of 8.6. He's got 20 top five finishes, finishing up in the top five in 49% of his runs, 30 top 10 finishes, finishing up there in the top 10 in 73% of his races. Can't top that. He has 1,699 whopping laps led, and he only has nine wins at the track. Looking at his stage point picture, has him collecting stage points in 22 out of 25 tries, and he has but one mere stage win. Kevin is the king of Phoenix here, there's no denying it. I have to go all the way back to 2013, that's 10 years, where he has not finished inside the top 10. This is a guy who can pick you up some of those all-important stage points this weekend. His team will be going all out to try and get that final victory for that four car. Looking back at the spring race, Kevin had the fourth best average running position, his driver rating was third, he was sixth fastest early, and in Kevin Harvick fashion, he was the fastest late in a run showing that long run speed that his team has perfected. He is the closer after all. On the combined short flats this season, Kevin is ranked second with an average speed rank of 6.4. His last run in Phoenix, Harvick ranked second with a speed rank of 3.25. He will be in the mix on Sunday, and it is also highly advisable to roster that four car for this one. All right, looking at our current points leader in the league, Larson 2023 20, still up there with over a 100 point lead. Mathematically, I think you've got it locked in there, buddy. And our current playoff points leader, this week's winner, Moonshiner 3 is now occupying the playoff leader spot. All right, that just about does it over here for this week. Now you have one last chance to check out Rowdy Dragon's NASCAR Fantasy Sportsbook for this season. Breaking down those head-to-head -head matches, pulling out all the stops on those long shots. Come on over and check it out. All right, as per usual, thanks for hanging out and listening to the Final App Weekly Fantasy segment of the show. I am Rowdy Dragon, and I will be back next week. There you go, Fantasy NASCAR from Rowdy Dragon and his picks for Phoenix this coming weekend. Let's you and I get into it. Let's talk about the four drivers in the NASCAR Cup Series that are going to be doing battle at Phoenix. In the desert, man, I think, okay, so first of all, before we, we do anything, I think this is the correct four. <laughs> I, I hope that you think it's the correct four. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, sometimes in sports you go, well, you know, like in baseball, you, you, you figure uh, somebody doesn't belong there. They they somehow got their way in there. They don't okay. deserve to be there. You didn't mean that your list was going to be incorrect. You meant, do these guys actually belong? Yes, yes. No, I think this is a good four. This is a solid four. I, I like the uh, the the ages. It's amazing. They're all under 31. Kyle Larson being the oldest, which is weird. Just wild to think, right? <laughs> so all under 31 years old. It's going to be a battle of the young guys. And I mean, these guys had the year. I mean, this, well, this is going to be awesome. It, you look at it, you've got a 75% chance of a brand new Cup Series champion who's never hoisted the Cup before. Kyle Larson's the only guy who's won a title going into this. And it was a couple of years ago at this very track we're going to. Right. Uh, so I'm sure there's some confidence there as well. And Blaney and Byron are the only two that uh, this is their first championship four race. Yeah. And when you look at those guys, William Byron's been the guy all year with six wins. And then Ryan Blaney's got all the momentum in the world after yeah. that incredible run through the round of eight. So those two guys have got to have confidence as well. And then you've got Christopher Bell, who's been so good in clutch situations throughout his career that he's got to have confidence as well, especially with how the Toyota has been running at these kind of tracks. So you look at this. I don't see a weak person here. I We see it a lot in these championship races where the championship four are the top four finishers. I feel pretty confident we're going to see that happen again this week. I mean, it just, these guys are all really good. They're all here for a reason. And, uh, man, I, I don't, I ultimately don't know who really will win this thing. My gut tells me, and you correct me or you pick who you want. I saw your article, but go ahead. I'm going Ryan Blaney. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> the, the confidence, the 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 speed, the just they've had everything completely lined up and, and working, firing on all cylinders leading up to this. They're peaking at the right time. Uh Blaney has admitted that he looked at some things in the offseason that he did wrong and has tried to correct them. His crew chief backed that up. I just feel so good about that number 12 team and Ryan Blaney, especially with the performance we've seen. 
Team Penske have in these final championship races. Joey Logano was near perfect uh, last year and a few years ago uh, in the final race of the year. I just, I see that continuing here with Ryan Blaney. I'm going to go a different route and for a different reason. I'm going to go with Kyle Larson. And the reason is he won the first race in the round and they've had the longest time to prepare uh, their race car for Phoenix. And so I'm going to go, and he's got to win there. He's got to win at Phoenix already. So, uh, you know, the championship year that he already had. So he's got the experience. He's got the longest uh, time to, you know, get the car prepared, his crew chief, his crew, all that stuff back in the shop. And uh, he's already got that experience with winning at Phoenix under his belt. Also seven top fives and 11 top tens. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely, I mean, I can see it. And again, I can see it with any of these guys. You look at Chris Revelle. He made the championship for last year, had a really good run at Phoenix, didn't ultimately win the championship. But, uh, I mean, he's he's a legit contender as well. He finished second in the championship uh, or third in the championship race last year. Uh, we've just we've got some guys here. And then, of course, William Byron's always a threat this year, it seemed, except for at Martinsville. Uh, of course, it's weird going into the championship race. They had their worst race of the season at probably the most inopportune time. But could that be a wake up call? Could that get them? Where they turn things around going into Phoenix, or is this a, a a preview of what's to come? Will they come out and just be struggling at, at Phoenix as well? We don't know, uh, but those are questions we'll have answered. I find it hard to believe, though, when you look at the body of work for that 2014 throughout the year, uh, that they show up to Phoenix with a car similar to what they had at Martin. So I, I believe they come out firing uh, at Phoenix. I would hope so. Let's take a look at Christopher Bell. He's probably the one with the least amount of decent stats at Phoenix. He's got no wins. Uh, no top fives, just four top tens. So uh, they better figure it out over there at JGR, which I'm guessing they probably have. Well, and the big thing was um, over the last few years, the Toyotas weren't super incredible at these short flat tracks. That was more of the the Ford Chevy uh, playground. Uh, they've gotten better this year. I mean, you look at uh, Bell's performance at Richmond uh, earlier in the year, finished fourth. Uh, Phoenix, he finished sixth. Uh, you look at uh, the other the other Richmond. Uh, where was he there? Let's see, twentieth. Uh, so he had an issue there. But overall, the the Toyotas have been much stronger uh, at these these shorter flat racetracks. Um, he's always been really good at Loudon as well. So I, I just feel like this is this is setting up well for him too. It feels like it's setting up well for all of them though. Yeah, I mean, it really does. It feels like it's going to be a a race that's probably won on pit road. Uh, on the last pit stop of the race. And if you look at things like that, that kind of bodes well for Kyle Larson, too. That's how he won the championship uh, back in 2021, an amazing pit stop at the very end of the race. Um, so that will be a crucial part of things as well. And then just the setups these 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 crew chiefs put under the car and then the adjustments they make throughout the entire race. Everything will be on display in this race. You will have to have it all to win in this field of four drivers. And at the end of the day, we're going to say the, the rightful champion is is the guy. Uh, that ends up winning this championship. Back to Blaney. He's got no wins at Phoenix, but he does have six top fives and 10 top 10. So uh, no slouch. No finished, run, finished runner up last year after leading over 100 laps when his teammate went on to win the championship. So right. I'm telling you, I feel good. I feel real good. I mean, it's it's early. We're recording this on a Monday, which is weird for us. We're usually a little later in the week. Yep, but you're um, going. You're going to Phoenix. I, so I will be in Phoenix. Travel days Wednesday. Didn't want a chance not getting a show out for the most pivotal week of the year. Right. So I, I just feel so good about this 12 team. It really reminds me of Joey Logano's first championship season, where they were pretty good all year, didn't have the most wins in the series, but then showed up when it mattered most. I really feel like that's what we're seeing here. And uh man, I just don't see any I don't see any kinks in the armor for these guys. I feel like they've got this thing figured out and uh i feel like they are they are the guys that are not doing anything wrong right now and i just i just see them executing and, and finishing this thing out well who's i think byron is the last guy we haven't given stats for he's got uh, 11 races under his belt at phoenix one win one top five of course that's the same race and then six top tens yeah so i mean you look at that and byron and larson have wins here blaney has a pretty good record here uh arguably was in the running for win the win last year probably could have won that race i'm sure he uh Took it a little easy on his teammate towards the end to make sure he didn't crash him out for the for the win. Uh, so you look at that and you think those three definitely have a pretty good shot. Uh, but I'm telling you, don't sleep on Chris Rebell either. Uh, the guy is good. And, uh, <laughs> and he's a guy that comes to life in these situations where he has to get it done. And that's always a scary trait. You look at guys like Tom Brady in the NFL. You look at 
him in a weight room, you're probably going to be like, oh, that's the guy we're playing against. But then on the field, <laughs> he always finds a way. And uh, that's that's kind of the Christopher Bell way. He's He's got that clutch gene. And uh, anybody who's got that, you've got to always respect them uh, in any one of these battles. Even if their career stats don't show that they're very good at a certain discipline, uh, you've got to be ready for them uh, at all times. I think he is the ultimate underdog, actually. I think he is the one that most people are going to forget about. And like you said, he comes up clutch time and he time does. again. And it's one of those things where you can't teach that. You can't train that. It's just keeping your cool in stressful situations under duress. Uh, it's something we've seen time and time again from him. Um, and I would not be shocked if he shows it again. That being said, I'm still picking Ryan Blaney. Um, but uh, it would not shock me for Chris Bell, And it would not shock me for any of these guys uh, to walk away as champion this year. It's a really, really good championship for field. Yeah, for sure. On a short track. Or is it? <laughs> a shorter, shorter track. Yeah, at least you and I agree on that, right? Yeah, it is not a short track. Anybody who says it's a short track doesn't need to be commenting on this ever again. Well, unfortunately, there's drivers that say that, so I don't know. I don't care what they say. <laughs> How about Harvick? It's his last race. Not only his last race, it's a, a last race at a track where, oh my gosh, he's good. Yeah, so that's the that's the key thing, because Harvick, you want to go out as a winner if you can, right? He didn't get the championship, obviously. He got knocked out early in the playoffs. But this is a chance for him to sneak up there and, and get it done one last time at a track, like you said, that he's dominated at throughout his career. No matter what situation he's been in, he goes to Phoenix Raceway. And, and you know, Kevin Harvick's got a shot to win this thing. So this is a situation where he could be the guy kind of out front while these other guys are battling behind him. Uh, it, and it, that would be interesting. Uh, if we could get a walk-off Kevin Harvick win to end his career, that would be – that would be a really sweet finish considering how close he's been so many times this year and weird situations keep popping up. They'll have the lead late, a caution will come out. And then late race restart happens, and we know what happens in those situations. So uh, we'll see how it goes. But I think it would be cool. What do you think? I think it would be cool to see Harvick win. I, I think of after the final, the, the, the championship four drivers, that's the driver you got to look toward for a big storyline, a big, uh, like you said, Hail Mary kind of situation and get that win for uh, walking off his career, basically and trading in his fire suit for a regular suit. So, <laughs> Well, there's uh, another guy to keep an eye on, too, Eric Almirola. He announced this week that's that right. he will no longer be full-time uh, starting next season. He nearly won this week at Martinsville, and another flat, shorter track is coming up this week at Phoenix. I could see Eric Almirola possibly upsetting things, too. He's very good at these kind of tracks. Stewart House Racing and Ford have been very good at these tracks this year. So they're another, another guy to kind of look at, which would be a kind of a cool storyline. I'm kind of shocked, to be honest, that we're talking about the last race of the year already. Dude, it feels like, <laughs> it's it feels weird. like Daytona was just here, right? Like It's just so strange. We have such yeah. a long, expansive, at times just nauseating season. But when we get to the end of it, we're like, it's already over? How? How's this right. possible? But it's 10 months, man. It's 10 whole months. And it feels like it's been a couple weeks. It's crazy. After next weekend, there's no baseball and no NASCAR. And those are my two two go-tos well you know what football, you can start so. doing you can start watching the miami dolphins man they're doing great yeah no thanks so yeah i'm just gonna sit in the dark and watch you know i'll start a wall oh come on cheer on my dolphins <laughs> real quick stats for phoenix it's a one mile oval remember it's all wonky now with the uh the start finish line over there on the back stretch or wherever you consider that now it's near the dog leg uh, banking up to nine degrees. Uh, I'm sorry, eleven degrees is the uh, the top. Nine degrees and one and two. Uh, stages are ninety, one twenty five, and one twenty seven. Everything's weird here. In fact, they even use kilometers. Three hundred twelve laps, five hundred kilometers. So, do you remember the six hundred kilometer race at Phoenix? I don't. When was that? Oh man, the Subway Fresh Fit six hundred. I believe. I think it was like twenty ten or twenty eleven. I remember when they announced really? it. It was like. It was like, yes, finally, because Phoenix <laughs> is always too short of a mileage race. And then that race happened, and it was like, okay, never mind. Go back, <laughs> never do it again. It right. was awful. Um, I, you know, I was doing the radio show then. I don't know why I don't remember that. I was there. I was there that weekend, and yep. that was the weekend from hell, because I think ARCA was there too, or KN at the time. Right. And it was just, oh, my gosh. It was just a weekend where there was too much. It was too much, man. Yeah. Um, and that race in particular was far too much. And they just kept having like tires failing and stuff and just caution after caution after caution. It was like, we're never getting out of here. So um, 
Sometimes less is more, is what you're saying. Sometimes less is more. <laughs> um, and as much as I hate the championship race not being 500 miles, uh, because I think the championship race should be a little bit longer of a distance, in my opinion. But All right. uh, I am very happy with this being a 312-mile race at, uh, at Phoenix. And don't forget all three series in action. Xfinity Series, those guys are Sam Mayer, Justin Allgaier, John Hunter Nemechek, and Cole Custer doing battle. Over in the Truck Series, we've got uh, Corey Heim, Carson Hosevar, Ben Rhodes, and Grant Enfinger going for their title. All three series in action. That's why it's called Championship Weekend. And another championship will be decided as well. The Arca Menard Series West Championship will be crowned as well. Wow. Looks like Sean Hingarani's pretty much got that thing locked up, but uh, it will be official uh, this weekend as well. Hey, congratulations to Haley Deegan, by the way. Yeah, engaged. Really, really cool to see. It's, uh, yep. you know, they've been long time, uh, long time boyfriend, girlfriend, and her and uh, Chase Cabry will now uh, be getting married. So really cool to see. I think we got a lot packed into the show. I mean, <laughs> this flew by. <laughs> Crazy. It did. Man, I am really excited. So I haven't been to Phoenix Raceway since probably that 600 uh, kilometer event. Oh, so you and haven't seen the complete remodel. No, it's last amazing. time I was there, it was the dungeon and it was terrible. And wow. So I'm very excited. I've heard a lot about this uh, this infield area. I just haven't had a chance to get back there since. And I'm really excited uh, to get back and check it out. That's awesome. Well, you have a good time and buy everybody a hot dog. And oh, you can't do what's, that. I guess. What's the uh, what's the at track uh, vendor item they like to do at Phoenix? No idea. Cactus Southwestern drinks? egg rolls or something. I don't know. <laughs> I I would guess they have a, have a, some sort of drink made in a cactus or something. Yeah, maybe so. because they really do have arms. Yes, they they do. <laughs> For those watching on YouTube, you can see Carrie <laughs> do the cactus arms. <laughs> I guess it's cacti arms. We have to we have to uh, mention that at least once somewhere in here. So I forgot all about that. And I think we were, we were almost through this show without worrying about it. So I know I got it in. I got it in. Nice. All right, nice check and flag is flying on the show. This has been the Final Lap Weekly. Catch us next week right here when we will recap Phoenix, the last race of the year, and preview nothing, the off season, I guess, and all the stories. We'll preview the, the future. <laughs> Toby, you and I will chat next week. We sure will, man. And really quickly, we're running out of Zoom time here. We'd like to thank our current list of Patreon paying people. Patreon.com slash the final app. Join in on the giving fun. So yes. fun. Yes, yeah, so much fun. And seriously, thank you guys all from the bottom of our hearts. This is this concludes in another another NASCAR season. Like we're going into it this week. This is it. The yeah. year is over. And you guys have been here along the way uh, all year long. We really appreciate you. Let's go through the list here. We've got Devin there at the only Master Giant level tier. Thank you, Devin. We've got Lalo. We've got Louisville Max, part of the Ultimate Final Lappers. Thank you, Louisville Max. We appreciate you, buddy. Robert Keane. We've got Jimmy B, Mr. Jimmy James, 1983. Quentin Whitaker from Daytona down there. I always see him. Super awesome, dude. Simon Green from across the pond. Troy Clark from down under. We've got David Letchworth, one of our sponsors there at the only Mattress Giant level tier. Thank you, David. We've got Peter Johansson, David Reed, James Maples the second, Joe Bike, the original sponsor of the show. Thank you, sir, there at the only Mattress Giant level tier as well. We've got Evan Taylor, Mike Hamilton, Nick Reed, Scott Clark, Alex Taylor, one of the ultimate final offers. Thank you, Alex. We've got Justin Kapasinskis. I'm sure he's excited that Kyle Larson has a chance at that second championship this weekend. And I bet you he's going to go against me and say that it's not going to be Ryan Blaine that's going to win, and then it'll be Kyle Larson instead. So we'll see how that goes. And, of course, the longest tenured listener, of this year's show, who's been listening since episode one, and we're now at what, 803? 803. Right? Yeah. 803. Charles K. Miller, <laughs> 803 hours have been spent listening to Carrie talk with either myself or somebody else over the years. So, congrats to you, Charles, and uh, congrats to everybody. Thank you so much. Excellent year. Back to you, Carrie. Yeah, totally. Uh, Patreon.com slash the final app. We out.